he opposed the French Revolution because he believed that it wrecked what generations had wrought and with it the prospect of organic growth. For Burke, society was both an inheritance and a point of departure. As he wrote in his reflections on the revolution in France, the idea of inheritance furnishes a sure principle of conservation and a sure principle of transmission. A society proceeding in this spirit will discover that in what we improve, we are never wholly new. In what we retain, we are never wholly obsolete. Hence, prudence is in all things a virtue, and in politics, the first of virtues. Its practice yields a politics which is Burke wrote in 1789, leads us rather to acquiesce in some qualified plan that does not come up to the full perfection of the abstract idea. Rather than to push for the more perfect, which cannot be attained without tearing to pieces the whole contexture of the Commonwealth. That distinction defines the disagreement between conservatism and liberalism in our society, between viewing history as an organic process or as a series of episodes shaped by self-will. It is also, <clears throat> it also accounts to some extent for the difference between Burkean conservatism, as I understand it, and some aspects of neoconservatism. I say suicidally in the presence of Norman Podoret. <laughs> <coughs> Let me say that I consider the latter difference a family quarrel. Many neoconservatives are personal friends of mine with whose analysis of any given situation I often agree. I have also become quite familiar with them, having been shot at by them from time to time, from both sides of the dividing lines. We differ not on objectives, but on the role of history in achieving them. The difference is often put as an abstract debate over whether power or values are the dominant force in international relations. The advocates of a so-called realist foreign policy are occasionally caricatured with the German term realpolitik, I suppose to facilitate the choosing of sides. In this caricature, international relations is described as a series of clashing billiard balls careening off each other at calculable and perfectible angles determined by their relative force. Values, it is claimed, are irrelevant to a realist foreign policy. The balance of power is its dominant or even sole motive force. The alternative approach is often put forward in the name of idealism. 
For this approach, American values are universal and transportable by predictable mechanisms and usually in a finite period of time. Conflict arises, it is argued, from the absence of democracy and it is overcome by the triumph of democratic values. This school of thought deals with strategic issues on the whole by analyzing domestic structures. According to it, relations are bound to be adversarial with imperfectly democratic societies. Relations are certain to improve as democracy prevails. Geostrategic analysis is deplored because it presumes the continued existence of faulty governance. Yet neither of these approaches seems to me to meet the Burkean test of accounting for the full variety of human experience and the complexity of statesmanship. The billiard table is a seductive analogy. But in real foreign policy, the billiard balls do not react only to physical impact. They are also guided by their own cultural inheritance, their histories, instincts, ideals, in short, their national values. A realist foreign policy needs a strong value system to guide it through the inherent ambiguities of circumstance. Even Bismarck, the supreme realist, emphasized the ultimate moral basis of realist statesmanship when he said, the best a statesman can do is to listen carefully to the footsteps of God, get a hold of the hem of his cloak, and walk with him a few steps of the way. The opposite approach posits that universal peace is achievable by engineering a world of democratic institutions. And that if history does not move quickly enough, we can move it along by military force. My concern is that the ultimate goal may be so remote and the method of reaching it so uncertain that it leads to cycles of interventionism followed by abdication, as in Vietnam, Iraq, and Afghanistan, each of which I supported without abdicating. The difference is less of destination than of pacing. The point is not that what exists is untradeable, but that the more enduring effort and sustainable effort over the long run requires that we temper the visionary aspect of policy with a recognition of the variety and complexity of circumstances. The current situation in the Middle East is instructive. The Arab Spring was initially greeted with exuberance as a regional youth-led revolution on behalf of liberal democratic principles. But as Burke recognized, revolution succeeds through the confluence of many 
desperate grievances. The dissolution of the old regime inevitably brings with it the need to distill from these grievances a new version of domestic authority. And the more violent the upheaval, the greater generally is the assertion of force in reestablishing authority. This process is often violent and far from automatically creating civil tolerance and individual rights. At its best, it is the beginning of a journey towards these goals. America can and should assist in this journey. But we must take care that we do not equate democracy with one-party elections and sectarian dominance. 